Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Eric, um, and I was very excited to be invited to give this talk, um, which I'm going to be talking about, I guess, two-thirds of salt. Um, so what can we do with sodium doublet absorption NH1? Um, this is a new area for me. I mostly work on the neutral ISM, so I'm coming from typically higher column densities. So in my first foray into the CGM, this is perhaps the most comparable part of looking at the highest column density part. Uh, and this is an unfinished story. This is work that I'm doing with Theo and Jesse, and so your input on it and ideas would be most welcome. Okay. So if we're observing the fine scale cold CGM, uh, we've seen examples of it already, but we have a couple different ways in which many of these observations have been done. The UV absorption uh, for the hydrogen lines is an incredibly sensitive low column density tracer. Uh, but of course, with absorption lines, we're limited to the number of lines of sight that you have available, and saturation starts to become an issue as we get to this, these higher column densities. On the other hand, the 21 centimeter hydrogen line gives us these complete maps. Uh, but to get down to the sensitivities where you can trace the bulk uh, neutral gas in the CGM, you need a really big dish. So something like a G the Green Bank Telescope. Um, and this means that you're somewhat limited to sort of coarser scales. Now there's one other way that we can use the 21 centimeter line, uh, and that's in absorption. And the absorption's really nice because it's basically just tracing opacity. So it's a very clean tracer of the cold neutral medium. And that'd be your sort of 100 Kelvin gas, the phase that's most similar to the molecular phase uh, and you know, between the volume filling warm neutral medium in the molecular phase. And so the results I'm showing here is brand new work from our new local group L-band survey. This is work led by Nick Pingle. Uh, and this is the first detections of the CNM using 21 centimeter absorption in the Dwarf Galaxy NGC 6822. Uh, this is hundreds of hours with the VLA. Uh, and when this gives us two detections, yes. It's also close in velocity to the galaxy, and so I'm showing, the example I'm showing here, we actually have two components. One is the galactic one, uh, and one is the one coming from 6822. And you can see we tried this for a number of different lines of sight, limited by the sensitivity that we have with the VLA, and mostly, you know, as you might get out into something like more CGM components outside of this galaxy, though it's a bit of a weird system, uh, we, we're not actually detecting anything. But we're, again, really limited by the number of lines of sight that we can probe. And really to emphasize this, uh, you know, we don't actually know about most about the cold neutral medium, and that's true in both the ISM and the CGM. So I'm showing based what would be an ISM result here. This is the fraction of the CNM that's been measured by these 21 centimeter absorption measures for different local group galaxies, it's shown um, as a function uh, decreasing metallicity for reasons I don't remember why we did that, but anyways, this is lower metallicity, this is higher metallicity. Uh, and the thing I want you to take away is there's huge error bars. And those error bars are a combination of two things. One is very few lines of sight, and the other is real physical scatter that we're measuring within the CGM, or CNM for all of these different galaxies. The reason it's shown with metallicity is uh, what we can see here comparing to these phase diagrams, so this is pressure as a function of density. Uh, these are your sort of multi-phase medium or two-phase medium diagrams between heating and cooling uh, in the ISM. And so for typical, oh, right, this isn't plugged in. There we go, all right. Uh, and so the, right, the idea of our multi-phase neutral ISM is coming from this range of pressures where between heating and cooling, you have a warm and a cold neutral medium that can be held uh, in pressure equilibrium. But what, the reason I'm showing this is just as a function of metallicity uh, is what is happening with all of these different colored curves that you see. And so the point is, if we don't know very much about the CNM as a whole, uh, how are we really going to be able to measure it or constrain these models or predictions when we change the metallicity quite a bit? So overall, we'd like to, you know, the problem is our limited number of lines of sight where we can trace this particularly high column density gas. What's the solution? Can we find something that actually allows us to trace a much larger number of lines of sight, or just simply more? Uh, and this is where sodium came in, uh, in something that uh, Jesse brought me into in about a year ago. Uh, Jesse's going to explain a lot more about sodium absorption, so I'm going to skip over that just a bit. Uh, this is also all his work, so 
you know, if you find mistakes, please, please just go to Jesse. <laughs> uh, but the point here is that uh, this is a spectrum toward an optical spectrum toward a background galaxy. Uh, and what, he, what Jesse's showing here is the fit to the sodium doublet, and he's finding two components. One with a velocity that's just a little bit off of the rest velocity, so that would be something quite local to us in the ISM. And the other, um, in this case, blue shifted by about 200 kilometers per second, so something that would appear to be coming from the high velocity clouds. And when you compare that to the H1, um, you get you know, a really nice um, correlation in terms of the kinematics. So it's really suggesting that they're tracing the same phase. The issue here is that this is vastly different spatial scales. The sodium absorption is some you know, size of fiber, arc second, few arc seconds. Most of what we have for the H1 uh, tracing large scale is by these single dish telescopes, so something like 16 arc minutes or so. And so, uh, just starting here with what does the high velocity clouds look like, I'm just going to give you a bit of a story of how I came into this. So, here we go. All right, so this is this uh, from Hi4 Pi. This is this work by Westmeyer, uh, just trying to identify basically where are all the high velocity clouds um, surrounding us. You're going about to see something more in 3D that Theo is going to talk about at the end of the next session. And of course, since it's H1, you also get the velocity. And so you can see this large velocity structure. I've hidden the color bar, which is not useful, but it's something like minus 400 to 400 kilometers per second. So you both get both the blue and the red shifted side of the high velocity clouds. Uh, and with Jesse and Theo, we were looking for some interesting lines of sight. Um, and so I'm going to just focus on this little blob here. You'll see why in a second. That's the blob. Isn't it great? So that's column density. That's the centroid velocity. Um, and the thing that we wanted to look at together was from these places where Jesse found sodium absorption, um, we wanted to follow up and get the, a better constraint on the H1 column density. The values that we were finding from these single dish surveys with quite coarse resolution tended to be much lower than what you find with the sodium. So we wanted to do follow up with the VLA to get sort of deep, uh, sort of arc minute scale, so increasing the spatial resolution by at least an order of magnitude. This looked like a great target. It's got a you know, significant velocity gradient and whatnot. Uh, we went to look at high velocity clouds. Turns out it's not a high velocity cloud. This is the M81 system. <laughs> it's not too surprising. I actually got much more excited at this point because this is the kind of thing I study. So it's all coming together. <laughs> all right. So what can we do with nearby galaxies and sodium absorption? Uh, this is the galactic frame. I'm just going to reorient us a little bit. Uh, because I'd prefer to look at RA and DEC. There we go. So same picture. Uh, if you're not familiar with the M81 group, you should be. It's wonderful. Center galaxy here is M81. That's this big thing. Uh, and then you have these wonderful H1 tidal tails. Uh, so here's M82. That's the starburst as that blanked out part. Uh, and then we have the two other major parts of, of this group. Um, I forgot to put the citation on here. This is this great paper by Erwin de Bloch in 2018 covering about three squared degrees with the VLA. It's about 100 pointings. It's a really nice data set. So uh, what did we do? We looked at these few pointings, uh, thinking we were find high velocity clouds. Three of those are probably M82 and M81. Uh, but this one is interesting. This is probably a high velocity cloud. It's just a high velocity cloud in the M81 group. Uh, and so this is the location of the H1 absorption. There is this um, blob that's admittedly not looking uh, too clear here, but it is a very nice detection. Part of the problem here is uh, you get this really strong absorption from the center of M82, uh, and it's a bit of a pain to deal with, so that's why it looks a little ratty. But basically, this worked particularly well. So, well, what could you do in the future? And so this is the unfinished part and sort of like looking ahead to where might be able to use this uh, sodium absorption measurements towards some of these interesting systems. And basically, I'm just using M81 as a test case. It's also the closest interacting group, and it looks very nice. All right, so this is the same image we were looking at before. These are the sources of radio source, or, um, background radio sources that are bright enough that we could get a pretty good um, constraint on the CNM fraction from H1 absorption. It's pretty sparse. Looking ahead to the future, uh, this is the type of um, 
density that we'd expect from something like the SKA mid or NGVLA to be able to provide. This would be something like 10 hours on source, so reasonable for what you'd be able to get with a typical length observation, let's say. Uh, this would be just in one area. did want to point out DSA 2000 is going to be extremely good for finding these interesting sources all over the sky. You could imagine doing uh, deeper pointings with the SKA and NGVLA to do better. Uh, but really, this brings me to my last point. I love H1, but if we could do this with sodium absorption, you, you, know, you can actually fill in the field significantly better. So even you know, neglecting, these are, by the way, these are Gaia, QSOs, and galaxies um, with uh, G-band magnitude brighter than 20. Even if we ignore what is clearly just coming from the galaxies themselves in the middle here, it's about 10 times denser. And so you can imagine trying to use this to much better constrain the detection fraction of this really high column clumpy CGM gas. And the other part that I found quite interesting uh, is uh, trying to look at the velocity coherent structure, and in particular combining different measurements from, for example, the H1 with this close pair that you can measure in the sodium absorption. So getting a much better constraint on the structure function um, of the velocity there. And so looking forward, uh, it's really the ability of many fiber spectrographs that would let you do this efficiently. Uh, and so maybe we could do some of these things. Uh, and again, this is my first foray into the CGM. So what have I missed? Do you have any other thoughts? I'd love to hear it. And I will turn it over to Jesse after the break to tell you more about sodium absorption. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please. So I was just wondering, um, do you worry about the ionization state of the gas when you're talking about sodium 1D? Yes. It's pretty far, and, and I guess you're going down to columns much below sub DLAs, so they are not entirely neutral. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was also why I put the detection fraction part. So there would be some uncertainty in getting the column density, but I think or some of what Jesse has shown as well uh, is just having those constraints on the detection fraction I think would be, would be quite interesting just from a much larger number of sources. The velocities can also be quite constrained. Yes, yes. Yeah, great talk. Could you could you talk a little more about why it's sodium one in particular, um, as opposed to say calcium two? Like, there's other lines in the optical, some which are stronger than sodium one. So I'm just curious why the focus on sodium. So I think Jesse can talk to that a little bit more, but quickly compared to calcium, it's just that. Um, you know, these sources are brighter in those frequency rates, like the background sources themselves are brighter. And so that would give you access to a larger number of sources where you can okay, make this measure. Yeah. And it also wouldn't be CNN. Sorry? Calcium also wouldn't be CNN. Ah. Just, this is kind of a, why are there like 25 quasars in the center of M81? Which I idea. Yeah. <laughs> that, that can't be real, but like, no. No. So, so, yeah. So, so I grabbed the Gaia catalog. This is almost certainly just uh, misclassified sources with the MME one. So I wouldn't trust. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't trust any of this. And of course, that's the center of MME two. Yeah. So neglect what's in the center. Yeah. Uh, have you overlaid stars on the? Uh, you should like an off MME two. There's the HPC or the gas. I was wondering if you from like results of the population. Uh, just because I, I used to work on stars in the MMM group, and I think where you said there's an HPC, I think there's actually stars that may be associated with that. Yeah, I th and I think there is a pretty good correlation between where you see the, the higher density um, H1 tidal tails in the stellar populations. That's not something I know as much about. One last question. Yeah, Let's thank Eric again.